So everything in this chapter, all of these viruses are all human causing viruses, although we'll mention a couple that affect animals that can get, on, uh, get to humans from animals. Um, but they all have DNA as their main uh, nucleic acid, as their main genetic information. And so although we group them based on the fact they have DNA, there are seven families so seven groups of DNA viruses, and we're going to cover six of them, the six boxes that are on that flow chart. So we group them based on the type of DNA they have. So there's a bunch of DNA viruses that all have double-stranded DNA. Um, that's four of the boxes. Then there's one group that has part single-stranded DNA, part double-stranded DNA in its replication. Uh, whether they have envelopes or not, the size of the viruses can depend on which family they go into, and even the host cells they attack can depend on which family they group into. So there's a reason why there are six families that we're going to cover, seven families total. So here there are four families that all have double-stranded DNA that we're going to cover. There's a one family that has part double-stranded, part single-stranded DNA in its replication. And then there's one family that has single-stranded DNA, which is just unique all in itself because DNA usually is double-stranded. But there's one virus that just has single-stranded DNA. And we're going to start on kind of the left-hand side and work our way over to the right-hand side as we talk about them. So we're going to start at the very top with the Pox viridae family. So they're double-stranded viruses. Size-wise, I'm not going to close that door yet, uh, they are the largest of the viruses that infect humans. That even some of these we could see underneath our microscopes. Um, they are still much smaller than bacteria, but next to a bacteria, we might actually be able to see like a little spot, um, which would look like a little dust or something like that next to a bacteria. But they're the largest. There are a lot of pox viridae viruses that affect animals, and a few of them are transmitted to humans when we come into contact with the animals themselves. Normally those are not very deadly, more of just annoyance than anything else. But there are two viruses that are in the pox viridae family that do cause human disease. Smallpox and molluscum contagiosum. They are both picked up by inhalation and close contact. And it does have to be close contact. These viruses do not survive outside of the host, out in the environment, for very long. So it's generally very close contact uh, with someone that's infected. And they do all produce some type of lesions where they get their name, the pox viruses, um, is kind of those warty spots that happen on the, um, the bottom, on the body. So there are three, you know, or four lesions they go through. The first is going to start out with macules. These just almost look like red spots. They are flat. They're not itchy. They're just you know, flat and red. And that usually happens when the, within a, you know, usually within a day uh, of picking up the infection. Then they're going to develop into papules. And the big difference with that is now we have raised red spots. So now they've actually, we've, we're starting to see more of a bump. But we're still not quite to what some of those pictures are indicating, but we can actually start to see some of the progression um, on this bottom picture. After the papules, then we get into what are known as vesicles, that it's not just a raised lesion that's sticking up. Now we have vesicles, which are going to be fluid filled. And usually it's a pretty clear fluid. And then eventually they end up to what's known as pustules. And based on its name, they are pus filled. And so then we get that just a liquid, that pussy liquid in those lesions that will cover the entire body. Now, Smallpox is really, this is what these pictures are showing. Smallpox is going to be way more severe than molluscum contagiosum. Molluscum contagiosum, much more common, and it generally, it's not going to look like that, but it does still produce these raised bumps that are quite itchy. Now, the smallpox, which officially is also known as variola, 
most of these viruses have like the very common name disease and then they have a more of virus name disease. We generally just call it uh, smallpox, but its virus name is variola. It infects internal organs. So although it is outwardly showing as these various lesions and progressing, it affects internal organs. It will ultimately cause fever, malaise, and delirium. It can easily cause fevers of over 106. It is very deadly. It travels around in the blood, which is how it gets out to the skin and causes those pus field lesions, which we have named as pox. But as, and I'm like, and once these pox um, erupt, you are left with, lesion, like, with scars all over the body. So if you survive, you are going to be usually pot marked and the skin is going to have scars all over the entire body. The good news is, though, we have actually eradicated smallpox. We developed a vaccine that was extremely effective um, that no one gets smallpox anymore. It's gone, like nowhere. You can't travel to some random place and get smallpox anymore. That actually in 1972, we stopped even vaccinating for it because why vaccinate for something that's not around anymore? And it's all because we developed a very effective vaccine. Um, but then I was having like, well, don't we have other effective vaccines? Yes. but. Some things that helped eradicate it, other than the very effective vaccine, is smallpox um, never has asymptomatic carriers, which means anyone that gets smallpox is going to show outward lesions, and they're going to show them very quickly, which means you can isolate them and quarantine them to stop the spread. So because it shows that outward lesion, we can quarantine them, and because we had an effective vaccine with it, we eradicated it. Now, because it is so deadly and it is spread rather quickly, there is still the worry that, because of course the CDC, World Health Organization, still has stockpiles of these viruses um, in their labs, that what if the wrong person gets a hold of this virus in a lab? Um, and I haven't been vaccinated for it. Um, no one's been vaccinated for it since 1972. Um, what if someone gets, you know, someone gets it and it, it could be used as a possible bioterrorism? Um, there's a thought. So there's actually still one group of individuals um, that we still vaccinate. Any guess? Only because you might know someone that has been vaccinated for it. It's this weird, like, pronged vaccine. As I say, we still vaccinate the military. And so if you know anyone that's gone into the military, they've been vaccinated for it. Um, the vaccine, they actually dip this metal prong in a live virus. It's been, you know, modified so it can't cause disease. And they put that modified virus under the skin and it will truly, right at that injection site, go through these stages. But it stays at the injection site. And so to know if they've had that smallpox vaccine or not, they will have a scar wherever it was, because they will have that pus-filled lesion right there. Um, I had one semester that right when I was talking about this, I had a military person that had just had that done. Um, he's like, do you want to see? I'm like, no, because it's gross and nasty and because it goes through all those little stages. Um, but we still, we still vaccinate our military, you know, just in case, you know, bioterrorism, we want to keep the military out there fighting uh, for us. But otherwise, we're not vaccinated for it. Now, the other pox virus that is out there that is still affecting humans and causing issues is the Molluscum contagiosum. It is definitely not as severe. It's not deadly. It's definitely more of an inconvenience than anything else. The official name of the virus is Mollusca pox virus, and it causes a skin disease. It develops these smooth, kind of waxy, almost shiny papules on the skin. And so like, you can kind of see they look shiny, almost like they're a little waxy covered. And where they show up is anywhere you itch. So if you get that virus on your hand because you touch someone else's skin that had the virus, and then anywhere you itch on the skin, you really are ultimately like opening and exposing that virus to um, the body, to get inside the body. Now, the top places that people itch, um, where you end up getting these waxy papules, it's the face, I mean, the time, number of times that you touch your face, um, the trunk, 
and your external genitalia. So it's, apparently you guys itch there a lot. Um, so those are the top three places that these waxy papules show up. Now, the individuals that are spreading this particular virus the most are actually kids in daycares, because you know, kids in daycares are dirty, they touch everything, they don't wash their hands very well. Um, it's just kids, kids are dirty. And so daycares are actually the ones spreading this the most. Now the virus in these papules will go away on their own, but it could take several months for these papules to eventually go away. And if you have these all over your face, <laughs> you probably don't want them on there for months. Um, so they can remove the infected nodules. They can go in and kind of like a wart. They can um, freeze them off. There's chemicals that can get them off. Um, and so we can remove them. Biggest way to prevent is good hygiene. So I'm like, it's out there. Now, the other pox viruses that are out there are generally animal viruses. And so there are lots of pox viruses that affect animals. Um, and if we as humans come into very close contact, frequent contact with infected animals, we can get them. It's known as a zoonotic disease. Again, anything that has that word zoo in it, it's animal related. It just means that we can pick up various viruses from different animals. Now, they usually cause more of a mild infection because the virus's main goal is to get into that particular animal, not into us. So you might have some of those lesions. They might be itchy, but they're not deadly. Two of the ones that are the most common animal viruses out there for the pox viruses are cowpox and monkeypox. Um, cowpox was the more frequent one. I mean, neither of these are very frequent anymore. And Edward Jenner is the one that actually figured out that milkmaids that were in very close contact with cows, although they would get sores on their hands, they were completely immune to smallpox. Because those viruses, smallpox and cowpox, are both in the pox viridae family, and they are still quite similar to each other, um, because the body recognized cowpox, it could actually recognize smallpox as well. And so he actually developed a vaccine using milkmaids um, against smallpox that he realized that if he could take that pus-filled fluid in those pox on the milkmaids and put it into someone else, those people were actually immune to smallpox. So developed a vaccine using the cowpox. Monkeypox, we don't have that around here. We don't have a lot of wild monkeys around, but different parts of the world, they do. Um, and actually monkeypox cases are on the rise. So if you are traveling to somewhere and you're gonna play with wild monkeys, um, it's on the rise and it's not really because we're going out and there's more monkeys or we have more interaction with monkeys. The thought right now on why monkeypox is going up is because we're not vaccinating for smallpox. So the thought was if you were vaccinated for smallpox, you'd also be more immune to some of these animal pox viruses. Um, but because we're not vaccinated for smallpox, now you're a little more susceptible to monkeypox. Again, it's not deadly, it just causes more pus field lesions, annoyance um, than anything else. Now, what's one pox virus that you would think would be up here? Chickenpox. Chickenpox is not a pox virus, even though it has that pox name in it. But chickenpox is coming up very, very shortly um, in our lecture. Because we get to our next group of double-stranded DNA viruses, and it's the herpes vi uh, virus group. And everyone always thinks, oh, herpes, oh, that's, you know, that causes cold sores, there's genital herpes. Yep, those are two of the herpes, but there are ultimately eight human herpes viruses that infect humans. There's eight of them, and virtually everyone, everyone in the world, will have picked up one herpes virus in their lifetime. So I'm like, and you're like, what? No. Yeah, I've had it. We'll figure out which one. I'll tell you which one when we get there. Um, but just about everyone's had a herpes virus. Again, everyone always thinks of herpes. Ah, uh, the cold sore or the general herpes. Those are only one and two. There's still a three, four, five, six, seven, and eight um, herpes viruses. So it's a large group of the herpes viruses. Now, they do all have linear double-stranded DNA. They're the most prevalent of DNA viruses. Again, virtually, I think they say 99% or more of all humans in this world will have picked up a herpes virus in their lifetime. And the unfortunate part is most of these viruses in the herpes group can go latent, which means they can go dormant in the body and then reactivate and cause issues later, which means they just don't go away which you know, would be great, but they don't just go away. They hang out in the body. 
Now their species names, as we call them, human herpes virus, and then we give them a number, and it was the number based on when we discovered them. So we just chronologically numbered them. So there's a human herpes virus one, human herpes virus two, and then three, four, all the way to eight. So our first ones, we generally talk about them together. They both behave the same as the human herpes virus one and human herpes virus two. Um, they're both, they both cause slow spreading lesions. They used to be called the herpes simplex virus. We don't call them that anymore. Now we just call them the human herpes virus one and the human herpes virus two. And the reason we talk about them at the same time is so they both cause the same kind of issues. The only real difference between the two of them is the human herpes virus one generally causes skin lesions above the waist and the human herpes virus two generally causes skin lesions below the waist. And so I'm like, it's the one that's more tied to sexually transmitted disease. Now, the types of infections, I don't remember if I had more pictures. Oh yeah, I do. Um, so the ty different types of infections that they can cause, the most common one that most people think of when they think of herpes um, is that it can call or cause oral lesions or cold sores. And again, this is a virus that can go dormant, which means you can get a cold sore and then the virus goes dormant and then you, know, you get stressed and then it comes back and you get another cold sore. Um, that virus is still hanging out in the body. It can cause genital sores. Um, what other pictures I have? I've got another picture. One is neonatal. If someone has human herpes simplex virus two, because it is found in the reproductive tract, what can happen is that when infants are born, they actually pick up that virus from mom during childbirth. And that means they can now have lesions all over their skin. Um, it can cause serious um, issues. It's been known to cause blindness if it gets into the eyes. Um, so I'm like, it's detrimental to infants at childbirth. Um, it can get up by the eye and cause, they're called ocular herpes. Just means it almost looks like a huge, horrible cold sore right by the eye. I have to imagine that's painful and irritating um, when it's right at the eye. It can also cause something known as a Whitlow. And this is when it causes lesions on the fingers. And anywhere you have a lesion, those lesions are where you have actively shedding viruses. So those are the infection points. That's how it's transmitted. And so if you have a lesion on your finger, that truly means anything you touch, you are laying viruses down. So I'm like, they always say, anyone that's in the healthcare field, if you have uh, a Whitlow, you need to have gloves on the entire time you work, no matter what. Because otherwise, anything you touch, you're spreading this particular virus. Oh, I didn't have another one. I thought there was another one I had. Oral genital ocular Whitlow. Oh, neonatal. Well, there's one called herpes gladiatorum. Um, it affects primarily wrestlers um, because wrestlers are very close contact with each other. All it takes is one lesion um, and they can spread it. And it's usually the human herpes virus too uh, that it's spread because it can be any, I mean, it doesn't only have to be on the, genital on the genitalia. You can still have lesions in other areas of the body. So depending on where those lesions are, kind of depends on the type of infection, but it's still all the same herpes, the one and two. Now the, those active lesions are the source of where the virus is used to spread. So it gets transmitted, it gets in the body through any cut, through any sore, through any mucous membranes of like the eyes. And when that virus gets in, as it starts to attack various types of tissues, it will kill the cells because that's the job of the virus. Get inside, hijack a cell, ultimately kill it as that virus becomes, or as that cell becomes a virus producing factory. But it will form what's known as a syncytia, which is fused infected cells. So as these cells are dying, kind of what's left of them fuse into this large single looking cell. So that's our large single looking cell and the vi it's also still a huge virus producing factory but it allows that virus to hide a little bit from our immune system as it hangs out in these large syncytia and it's not the only virus that causes these syncytia there's another one coming up too now the human herpes virus one infections um, the top people that are spreading human herpes virus one are children Again, and I'm like, everyone's like, oh, give me a kiss. Oh, I can totally spread it if there's cold sores. Um, kids are dirty. They're always touching everything. Again, they're not the greatest hygiene. 
Um, human herpes virus number two, the top individuals that are spreading it, because it is a more sexually transmitted disease, are generally sexually active adolescents, are the top spreaders of human herpes virus two. Now, one and two are extremely common. Um, they say on average 80% of those, I don't know if it's US or worldwide, are already carriers of human herpes virus one. Um, and we'll have picked it up at some point. It's usually kids. Now, diagnosing it, most of the time they just look at those characteristic lesions. There are some tests to confirm, but that's expensive, and normally the doctor will be able to look at you and be like, yep, looks like herpes. Um, treatment, there are things to help make those lesions go away. The lesions will go away. The virus will not. All it does is it causes that lesion to heal up quickly, which is good because that lesion is an infection source to go infect other people and we want that to go away and they're unsightly anyways. Um, but it will not get rid of the virus. The virus will still be in the body. In the body. It's still latent. So prevention to try to not have them um, is if you're in the healthcare, making sure you're wearing gloves so that you don't pick up the virus or if you have it, you don't spread the virus because of the human herpes number two, sexual abstinence. Condoms can slow it, but honestly, if there's any sore um, in the genital area, that virus is gonna spread, whether there's a condom there or not. Um, it's any open sore can spread the virus. Human herpes virus three. This is known as the varicella zoster virus. And this particular virus, same virus, causes two different diseases depending on the first time you have an infection or depending on the second time that it's reactivated. So it's called the varicella zoster because the first disease is called varicella and the second disease is called herpes zoster, but we know them by more common names. Varicella is known as chickenpox. So I've had chickenpox. I was a kid before there was a vaccine for chickenpox. So yes, I've had herpes. I had human herpes virus three. I had chickenpox. Now, it is more common in children, although now that we have a vaccine, it's less common. The problem is, is once you've had chickenpox, um, that virus goes dormant. It remains latent, which means that chickenpox virus is in my body and I can't do anything about it. So at some point in the future, I think it's like a third of people that have had chickenpox will develop what's known as shingles, which is the herpes zoster disease. So it gets reactivated later on in life, like decades later, something will trigger this particular virus to become reactivated. Now I say decades, on average, you know, 50 on up is when people start to get this reactivated. Although there are cases I've had students in college and they're like, nope, I had shingles, like it can get reactivated earlier than that. Um, something can trigger it. Now chicken pox is highly infectious. You know, unless you've been vaccinated. Um, it does spread through the respiratory tract. It can spread in the eyes, so coughing, sneezing, touching the eyes. And it's more of an annoyance. It's not deadly, um, at least not in kids. Um, but it does cause a red, itchy rash that can last for several days. It's annoying. Children are less affected by it than adults. And so children generally just get a really annoying red rash for several days. Adults, because they do have a stronger, more vigorous immune system, they're gonna have a stronger, more vigorous response, and the immune response can cause more severe side effects or symptoms. And so adults can generally have extremely high fevers. And I don't know if I would say it deadly. I'm sure, I have no doubt there's been people that have died of it as adults. Um, it's generally not deadly, but it's not uncharacteristic that adults that pick up chicken, co chicken pox um, are hospitalized for it. Now, after you get over the annoyance of it, um, it goes dormant. And then, yes, decades, hopefully decades later, um, it can get reactivated. Again, it's a latent virus. And this virus reactivates on the nerves, on your spinal nerves. So those nerves that are coming right off the spinal cord themselves, it gets reactivated on them. And wherever that nerve controls on your skin, and I've got a picture, is where you're gonna see and get a very painful red rash that can last for months. And so a lot of times you'll actually see 
the rash forming in lines because that's one nerve that is branched out and it's controlling just that section of the skin. Here's a better picture. So you have your spinal nerve. The virus gets reactivated on it and it goes out and causes that very painful rash right at that area that that particular spinal nerve controls. Now you have 30, 33 spinal nerves. I think in advance, don't you guys have to know them all? Maybe. Um, I don't teach advanced. Um, but you could have, you know, that really sore rash right there, but you have spinal nerves going all the way up. So you can have very painful rashes on your face if the spinal nerve is controlling it all the way down your entire body. Just depends on which nerve, spinal nerve, that it reactivates on. Now, diagnosing it, chicken pox, they're generally going to look for those characteristic itchy red lesions, um, and they're usually tracking to see if there's outbreaks of them as well. Um, they don't do a lot of lab testing to diagnose it, mostly because it's not deadly. We're not looking for a quick response um, to know what it is, and there's really no treatment anyways. Uh, shingles, they're not only going to look for that characteristic lesion that's usually in a line because of the spinal nerve that controls that area, they're also going to look at past history. You can't get shingles until you first had chicken pox. So if you guys have had the chicken pox vaccine, you guys are in the clear. Um, you don't have to worry about shingles because there's not a lot we can do. Chicken pox, it will go away. And I'm like, you know, it's itchy annoyance for several days. Um, shingles, again, it's a very painful lesion. If you've known anyone that's had shingles, um, anything that touch it, it's going to hurt. It's going to be very painful. And so it's just treating symptoms, you know, putting things on there to make it feel more comfortable, wearing loose clothing, just less irritation. But those very painful lesions can last for months. Now, I'd say prevention is difficult. Um, it used to be difficult, and the reason why it was difficult um, is just because you can be spreading the virus, chickenpox virus, without knowing you have it yet. Um, because a lot of times, once you pick it up, it could be several days before those itchy red lesions showed up, which means you could be spreading it and spreading it um, without realizing it that you were actually suffering from it yet. Um, but we now do have a vaccine for chickenpox. And we actually have a vaccine to prevent shingles. So you'll probably even see commercials. Um, I see them quite frequent um, advertising the Shingrix vaccine. We used to have a vaccine called Zostavax, and we still do use it. Um, but it was only like 60% effective. And so people are like, Psh, I don't know, I'll take my chances. Um, but we came out with the new Shingrix vaccine, I think, three years ago, four years ago, um, that we finally have been able to make enough of it that it's pretty available. Um, that's over 95% effective um, at keeping sh the chickenpox virus from reactivating. It will not make the va that virus go away. I still have human herpes 3 in my body. Um, even when I take this vaccine at some point in my life, um, it won't make the virus go away. It just prevents it from reactivating as the shingles. Then there's human herpes virus 4. Maybe you guys have had this, or maybe you've known someone that has it. Um, it's the Epstein-Barr virus. It is spread through saliva. This is the virus that um, it's spread by saliva. It gets into your epithelial cells. It spreads to your bloodstream, and then it affects your B lymphocytes, your B cells. So those are immune system cells. It's never good if you have you know, your immune system under attack. The disease that it causes is infectious mononucleosis. That in itself is a long word. What do we normally just call it? Mono. We just call it mono. I'm like, so if you've known anyone that's ever had mono, human herpes virus. Um, it's human herpes virus 4. What causes the symptoms of the human herpes virus 4 is the fact that your immune system is at war with itself. So your B cells, which are immune system cells, are under attack by the virus. So the only way to get rid of that virus is your T cells, your cytotoxic T cells, have to be able to recognize your B cells and kill them because they're infected. So you have one type of immune system cell attacking another type of immune system cell. So it's a war right there in your immune system. And because of that war, that civil war that's happening in your immune system, you develop the characteristic signs and symptoms of fever, tired, 
malaise, your spleen, which is where you have a large concentration of these um, B and T cells and where they go to, to die and get rid of and filtered, um, becomes very, very enlarged. Now, adults, and when I say adults, it usually means you have an adult immune system. So you have a fully developed immune system for an adult. This does not mean like 18 and up is the only time you can get it. It's when you have a fully developed immune system that's a strong immune system is when you're going to have um, the signs and symptoms of mono. Now, it can also cause extreme diseases as well, usually for people that are T-cell deficient because we need T-cells to kill the B-cells. But what if you don't have a lot of T-cells? Then we start developing more severe symptoms. So these are going to be people that have AIDS that are already immunocompromised for some other reason. Um, it causes extreme diseases, which is my next slide. So people that have no immune system, we're talking you're in the AIDS stage of HIV, can start developing kind of rare and unique diseases that you would never see unless you were lacking an immune system. One is called oral hairy leukoplakia. Um, it is a, almost a cancer that can happen around the tongue. Your tongue does not get hairy, but it does almost start to cause like divisions or not cuts, but almost like indents in your tongue. So it looks almost like it's, I don't know, I can't think of the word, separated. That's not the right word I want. Um, variegated, something like that. Um, but you start to get these almost like little divisions on your tongue. Again, I think that's where they get the hairy, but it's not hairy. People that have a la like a poor immune system, meaning they're already immunodeficient for something. Um, they don't have a wonderful immune system. It's deficient. It's still working, um, but it's deficient somehow. They can, uh, it can cause various types of cancer. So Burkitt's lymphoma is when the lymph nodes are now infected and it develops cancer of the lymph nodes. Uh, it can cause nasopharyngeal cancer. It can cause something known as chronic fatigue syndrome, Hodgkin's lymphoma. These are all people that are already immunocompromised are going to suffer some of these rare things. People that have a normal immune system, but it's not fully developed yet, meaning it's not a strong or an adult immune system, are usually asymptomatic. Most of the time, you're like, oh, you can only get this, you know, when you're adolescence, because I swear that's the time that I would know the most people that I've ever had uh, mono or adolescence. Um, that's about the time you develop a fully working immune system. Kids can still get mono, but a lot of times they're asymptomatic. You wouldn't even know that they had mono. It means they can spread it, but their immune system, because you don't have a strong immune system, it's not under a strong attack. Your T cells are not super active yet because they're still young. You know, the whole immune system is young, and so there's just not a strong civil war that's happening. Not a strong civil war, not a lot of symptoms. Once you get to that adult immune system, adolescent-ish on, you have a vigorous immune system, you're going to have a vigorous and very strong civil war, and you develop all those signs and symptoms of mono. Now, diagnosing it, they can go based on some of your characteristic signs and symptoms. You're fatigued, you're tired, um, where your spleen is over by your stomach, um, it's going to feel enlarged, it's going to feel painful right there if it gets large enough. They can test for it, just like we had that test that we did up in lab. This is literally the exact same company that makes it, that test for strep. They make the exact same type of kiss test for mono. They just use a saliva sample. Um, treatment, well, if you've got some type of cancer that came from it, you're gonna need some type of cancer treatment like chemotherapy. Mono, it's just treating the signs and symptoms. It's like, ah, oh, take a, um, some ibuprofen, get some rest, stay hydrated, eat. Um, and because your spleen is enlarged, um, you know, take it easy. Don't get hit there. You do have a huge artery that goes right to your spleen. And if your spleen is enlarged enough, it could rupture if it gets hit. Um, and if you rupture your spleen and you have an artery going to your spleen, what will happen? You could die, like easily. You bleed out um, internally within you know, minutes. Um, so that's why they always say, you know, you should not play sports when you have mono because that puts you at an increased risk of getting damaged and hit right where your spleen is and it can kill you. Um, yet adolescents are like, whatever, I know better. Um, any other conditions that it may cause, there's really not any other types of treatments. If your immune system is already deficient, you can't really fix that. Um, you know, it's just treating the, the symptoms that you can. Prevention, it is spread through saliva. 
And so making sure you don't share cups with someone. Don't take a drink and then have someone else take a drink. You know, don't share uh, the same bottle. Don't share the same straw. Don't share a toothbrush, brush, which is wrong on a lot of levels anyways. Um, but I'm like, it's not sharing. Don't, you know, eat someone's spoon that they were eating off of. It's, you know, just to prevent that spreading of the uh, virus that's in the saliva. Then there's human herpes virus five. Again, there's so many herpes. Um, this is uh, what no, it's also known as the cytomegalovirus, and the word means enlarged cells. So cyto means cell, mega means large. So when these infected cells get infected, they cause the like these cells to enlarge, huge, um, and then sometimes you get these dark staining portions that they say look like little owl's eyes. <laughs> so you have these large cell that almost looks like it has little owl's eyes looking at you. It's an extremely common virus. I'd say about half of all Americans carry this particular virus, um, partly because it's spread in any bodily secretion that you make. It can be spread in saliva. It can be spread in uh, like vaginal secretions. It can be spread in sweat. It can be spread in um, breast milk. I mean, it's like, you name it. If it's a secretion that comes from your body, this particular virus is in it. Now, luckily, it is almost always asymptomatic. Almost. Um, but it can cause complications in newborns. And so if mom has it, there are documented cases. It's not common, but it is documented cases that it can affect newborns. It can cause blindness in newborns. It can cause pneumonia in newborns. It can cause complications in some immunocompromised individuals. Again, it's mostly asymptomatic, but because the virus is out there, it can cause kind of some random unique diseases that are out there. To diagnose it, we look for those kind of owl's eyes underneath the microscope. Again, they like to kind of pair up a little bit. We do have other tests that can look for the virus itself. We can look for the DNA. We can do ELISAs and look for the antigens or even the antibodies. Treatment. Fetuses and newborns is difficult. Generally, it's like you can't prevent them from getting it. And by the time you diagnose it, pretty much damage is already done. We do have one drug that can prevent and slow down eye infections. Again, it won't make the virus go away, but it can at least decrease the infections that it causes right there. Now, it can be spread in any type of bodily fluid. So good hygiene is going to be a prevention but also because it can be spread in um, vaginal secretions, it can be spread in semen, abstinence or safe sex will stop the spread of this virus as well. Again, I, I had one, one student a few years ago that actually had a daughter that had a guy diagnosed. I can't remember, she had some really weird um, neurological symptoms that they were, it took forever to eventually narrow it down. And it was complications because of the human herpes five. Again, it's pretty rare that there are complications, but they can happen. Again, 50% of us are infected with it. Other herpes viruses, uh, we have human herpes virus 6 and 8. Uh, there's a reason I don't talk about 7, um, a little bit because we don't know a lot about 7. We know it behaves like 6, uh, the human herpes virus 6, but we don't know anything more than that, really. So the human herpes virus 6, um, the big thing that it causes is, is, is a pink rash on the trunk part of the body. It's very common in infants. Again, there's lots of things that causes rashes in infants. Um, this is one of them. Human herpes virus 6 causes a pink rash where it gets its name roseola. The rose is for like pink roses. There's a possible link. They're still working out definitive uh, research that this particular virus is linked to causing multiple sclerosis. Um, again, they're still getting enough research to confirm it, but they are doing testing and they are looking at most people that have MS um, also have had this particular virus as well. Seven again behaves like six. It causes just a pink rash right on that trunk of the body. And then the last human herpes virus eight only causes issues in those that have no working immune system. So people that are in the AIDS stage of HIV and it causes a cancer of the blood vessels. So it gets in and causes the cells that line our blood vessels to now be cancerous. 
So those cells are going to undergo uncontrolled growth, abnormal growth. We can actually start to see um, these are cancerous blood vessels right there in your gum line that's happening. This is all cancerous blood vessels where the blood then is then bursting underneath the skin. Um, it is deadly, um, so it is one thing that can kill those that have HIV infection. Again, it's rare. Those that have working immune systems are not going to suffer any complications from human herpes 8. More pictures. Whew, done with the herpes. Yeah, there's lots of herpes. Our next group of double-stranded DNA is the papillomaviridae group. Still double-stranded DNA. And the infections that the virus in this group cause are your papillomas, which are officially more commonly known as warts. So if you have a wart or if you've ever had a wart, you had a papilloma. Now, what a wart is, or a papilloma, is just a benign growth of epithelial tissue. So the cells that were right there at the epithelial, your skin surface, were growing uncontrolled to cause that now visible growth on your skin, but it's benign. It's not going to break off. It's not going to travel throughout the body. It's not cancerous. Really, you can get warts pretty much anywhere on the body. So they can be painful. They can be unsightly. I've got more pictures coming up. Um, we can get warts in the genital areas, which are going to put you at an increased risk of cancer. Now, there are lots of strains of papillomaviruses. Not all papillomaviruses are created equal. Um, so depending on the strain of the virus, some strains of papillomaviruses are more likely to cause cancer than others. Most papillomavirus strains do not cause cancer. Most of them just cause annoying warts, but some strains do cause cancer. Now, how they're transmitted is inanimate objects. So if you touch something that someone else touched and their wart touched it, you know, like you can pick up that virus. So the virus can be remain on inanimate objects. Um, that's one of the reasons they say you should never share shoes. People that have had planter's warts, which means there's a wart on the planter part of the foot, which is the bottom part of the foot. That means that virus is going to be in their shoe, and anyone else that puts that shoe on is not going to pick up the virus. Um, so touching intimate objects, um, just touching infected skin, you don't ever want to touch anyone else's warts because now they just transmitted the virus to you. Um, and it can even do something known as auto inoculation, which just means you're touching your own skin. So if I had a wart on my finger and I start touching everywhere else on my body with that finger, um, I am no longer going to have warts anywhere I touched. So you can actually auto inoculate or inoculate yourself by touching one part of skin to another. This is just showing some examples that you can truly have warts anywhere on the body. Now, diagnosing it can be quite easy because they're very visual, so you can just visually see the wart. If it's a genital wart, they may have to do a pap smear to visually see it. Treatment, we can remove the warts. I mean, there's lots of ways to remove a wart. There's over-the-counter things you can buy. My kids have had planter's warts. Um, but I'm like, you, there's chemicals that can take warts off. You can freeze them off. Um, you can like dry them off. You can heat them off. So I'm like, there's lots of different ways that you can remove a wart. If it does cause cancer, well, then you're going to have to undergo some type of cancer treatment, so radiation or chemotherapy. Prevention is difficult because there are so many strains of this virus, and it is so easily spread, especially by those inanimate objects. Abstinence and mutual monogamy can help stop the spread of the warts that are affecting the genitalia. And we do have a vaccine for some strains. So there is the vaccine now, the HPV, which is the human papilloma. I'm going to spell it wrong. One eye. Pap papilloma virus vaccine. <laughs> like long. Still may have spelled it red. Um, and again, we talked last time that some viruses can cause cancers. 
Well, we now have a vaccine against this virus, uh, at least some of the strains of this virus, which means we now have a vaccine that can prevent some cancers. Um, again, this came out after like, you know, they usually recommend 12, 11 and 12 year olds to start getting it um, because it does decrease your cervical cancers. It decreases any cancers um, of the anus, of anywhere in the genital area, uh, like any cancer, whether it's male or female, that they recommend 11 and 12 year olds, I think to start the first dose, I think it's two doses, um, to get the HPV vaccine. So. We're getting it. Most of this is not. Anytime you get a wart does not mean you're going to get cancer. Um, it's some strains of this vaccine can, or some strains of the virus can cause cancer. And then our last group of double-stranded viruses is the adenoviridae group, more commonly known as just the adenoviruses. They're single linear double-stranded viruses and most viruses in this group cause the common cold. These are not the only viruses that cause the common colds. There are RNA viruses that cause the common cold as well that we'll start going into next week. So not all the common colds are the same. It is spread by respiratory droplets. And so it usually causes respiratory infections. You've got a cough, you're sneezing, um, runny nose, kind of your basic cold type symptoms. It can get in and affect the intestinal tract and it can cause diarrhea. So it's not uncommon that you get a cold, you know, all your respiratory type drainage and um, sneezing. And then you also have some diarrhea along with it. Um, it can also get into the eye and it can cause pink eye, uh, conjunctiva now, or conjunctivitis. Now, there's pink eye that are caused by bacteria and there's pink eye that's caused by viruses. Easy ways to tell the difference um, because they're treated totally different. If you have a pink eye created by a bacteria, how do you treat it? Antibiotics, super easily treatable. If you have pink eye caused by a virus, there's no treatment. Ultimately, you have a common cold and it just unfortunately is also affecting the eyes at the same time. There's no treatment, it will just go away. Now to know the difference, because I, of course, as a mom, took my kid to the doctor for every pink eye they got, because you know, if it's bacteria, you want it treated. Um, to know the difference on whether to take them to the doctor or not, um, you can tell the difference in pink eye, whether it's bacterial or virus. If it's a bacterial pink eye, it will be gunky. Like you got that greenish, yellowish, pussy gunk. That's usually pretty characteristic with pink eye. Um, viral pink eye, you just have very pink eyes, but you're not gonna have all that drainage because it's not a bacteria that's in there causing all that infection. Um, it just means that you've got a cold. So if it's got very pink eyes, no gunkiness whatsoever, and your kid's also sneezing and whatever, they just have a cold, it would unfortunately will just go away on their own. There's no treatment. Um, there are lots of strains of adenoviruses. Again, lots of strains that can cause different kinds of colds, and it's not only adenoviruses that can cause the cold. We do have an attenuated vaccine. It's not super effective. Um, the only people that we generally even give it out to um, are some military. It will just decrease how many colds they have while in the military, but it doesn't last very long. It doesn't have a very long um, longevity with our immune system. So we can give it to military. They may get a few less colds, um, but it's only against some strains of adenovirus and there's lots of other strains that cause the common cold. Now, done with our double-stranded DNAs, onto our part double-stranded, part single-stranded, and there's only one that we're going to talk about it, and it's hepatitis B virus. Now, hepatitis B causes hepatitis, which the word hepatitis just means inflammation, that's the itis, and the hepat means liver. So it's inflammation of the liver. Now, symptoms of liver inflammation, even just based on my picture alone, jaundice is going to be a big one. So that's the yellowing of the skin, yellowing of the eyes. Um, it's very easy to see yellowing of the eyes more than it is of the skin, because some people already kind of have a yellowish tinge to it, and maybe if they're really tan, it's really hard to see. But the whites of the eyes should always be white, um, and they can turn yellow as well. Also, because you do have inflammation of the liver, and the liver is huge, it's going to be painful on the right side of their body. That's going to be, you know, their liver is going to be very sensitive and sore. They're also going to be tired. They may have a fever. Again, they are under attack by a virus. 
Now, hepatitis B in itself is not deadly. Um, it is inconvenient. I shouldn't say it's not. You know, there's always that one, you know, a few cases here and there. Combine it with a few other things. It could be. However, if someone also picks up hepatitis D at the same time they have hepatitis B, so when they have the two viruses together, it's called a co-infection, this is when it is deadly. The two together, hepatitis B with hepatitis D, causes liver cancer. And that can be deadly. So it can permanently damage the liver, it can cause cancer of the liver, and that can be deadly. So hepatitis B, you're like, eh, it's annoying. Um, generally not deadly, but if at the same time you pick up hepatitis D, which is actually an RNA virus that we'll talk about next week, um, when you pick up the two together, it can be deadly. So it's like you don't want one because you, know, you don't want to accidentally get the other one too. So hepatitis B is spread through just about any secretion that our body can make. And it takes very little. So again, some viruses, you need quite a lot of viruses just to get in the body to cause the infection. This takes very few. They don't have a definitive number, but it takes a very low dose of viruses. So it's easily spread with any type of secretion. So any type of, you know, drinking out of someone else's glass. Um, it is spread through sexual secretions, but any small amount, it can get in the body. For a lot of individuals, they could be asymptomatic, might not even know you have hepatitis, could cause a very mild symptom, a very slight jaundice, maybe a little pain, maybe you're a little tired, um, and nothing too more. But we can prevent it because ultimately we don't want to get it in the first place because if you also get hepatitis D, it can cause permanent liver damage and it can um, kill you. So we can vaccinate against hepatitis B. And I think it's a three dose vaccine series. Um, very effective. Generally, the vaccine three-dose series gives you, I think they say, at least a 20-year um, like protection, if not lifelong. There are some links to getting liver cancer for people that have had hepatitis B. Again, anytime you start to damage the body, any tissue, even if it gets repaired, that damage could linger and there could be a mutation somewhere in some cell that could develop into cancer later. So although you may have inflammation of the liver and then it goes away and you're fine, that may eventually show forth in 20 years later um, as liver cancer. Now to diagnose, they're going to look for the antigens and they're called Dane particles, but they have very unique shapes to the particles themselves. They've got these long tubes and then circles as well, so that they can look for the antigens. Treatment, there is no universal treatment for hepatitis B. Um, we've got a few things that sometimes work, sometimes don't for some antivirals. It's mostly just treating symptoms. And that's usually that, all that's needed. The best is just not get it in the first place, get vaccinated, get your three dose series. Um, otherwise, universal precautions, proper PPE, hygiene, abstinence, monogamy um, can all help decrease the spread of the, the virus. And then our very last virus, which has single-stranded DNA, which again is super unique all in itself because DNA is usually double-stranded at some point, is our parvoviridae group. And there's really, I mean, there are several viruses in this group, a lot of them affect animals and cause animal diseases. Um, they are the smallest in size of the DNA viruses, but the one that affects humans is called the B19 virus. They don't even give it a name, it's B19. Kids are the ones that are most affected by this virus, they're the ones that are spreading it, again, kids are dirty. Um, but this particular virus, its main outward symptom that it shows is that we get a, a rash, and in that rash, it could be anywhere down the kind of the trunk of the body, but it shows very predominant in the cheeks. And so they call it arithemia infectiosum. Um, the arithmia means red, that we have red skin. Um, it was also nicknamed as the fifth disease, because back in the 50s, before we had WebMD and Google, um, doctors had lists of things like, here are the top 20 things that can cause childhood rashes. 
this one was number five on the list. Um, so they also called it the fifth disease. But it shows up very predominant in the cheeks, very red cheeks. That sometimes it also has the nickname of the slapped cheek syndrome because those cheeks turn super bright red. Um, other than that, in, you know, children may have a slight fever. Again, their body does have a foreign object in it, um, but it will go away on its own. It's nothing that they can treat anyways, um, and it generally goes away within about a week. Um, sunlight will aggravate it, though, and so if you already had ready red cheeks and then went outside, they'd be even redder. Again, you have a lot of blood flow right there at that skin surface uh, when you have it. So not horrible, just annoying more than anything else. So we ended the DNA viruses. You